Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 says, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Judea and I implore Sintiq to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you for that, Lord, that there is a peace that can guard my heart. Lord, how we long for that peace, how we long for that joy. Lord, billions of dollars are spent all over the years by those, rather, all over the 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 world by those searching for peace, a peace that surpasses understanding. And you say that we have it, as we just read, in Christ Jesus. Tell us about that, Lord, this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you may be seated. Please be seated. So verse 1, Philippians chapter 4, just going to go through these verses, verse by verse this morning, stand therefore my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in the Lord, be strong in the Lord. Now, there's a, there's a standing fast that an individual does. We spent a whole message a couple weeks ago on that. But there's a standing fast that a church does. And Jesus says that the gates of hell will not prevail against a church that is standing fast. Now, what will prevent a church from standing fast? What will prevent a church from kicking down the gates of of hell? Well, there are a number of things, but one of them is if men and women in the church are divided among themselves. And there was some of that going on in Philippi, the church that Paul is writing to. Let's read verse 2. Verse 2 says, I implore. That means I beg. I beg you, Judea, and I implore Sintik to be of the same mind in the Lord. It says, I implore, I implore. Now, if you're sitting down in this church today and you have a conflict with someone in the church, the Bible says, I implore. Actually, it's the Holy Spirit that says, I implore, God himself is begging you, stop it, be of the same mind. The church's battle against Satan, Jesus says, on this rock, the rock of the church, 
It says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But the church's battle depends on you all resolving conflict. And here's what I here's what I hear. But it's her fault. Here's what I hear. But it's his fault. And you know what I say when I'm in the middle of a conflict like that? And, and, and I hear this all the time, but I, 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 you know, because I hear it all the time because a church is a hospital of sinners. It's not a museum of saints, so there is conflict. But when I'm in the middle of one of them and, and I hear it's not, it, but it's his fault, but, 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 it's, it's her fault. I often say, well, I want to know who, which one of you is going to be the greater person here? Who's going to be the greater one? It's going to be the one who loves first. That's who it's going to be. What does that look like in a conflict? 1 Corinthians 16 or 11.24 says this. Do we have that, Wendley? 1 Corinthians 11.24 says, uh, no one should seek their own, but each one the others. No one should seek their own, but each one the others. And you'll read that and you go, what on earth is that talking about? No one should seek their own what? And when it says the others, the others what? Well, you fill in the blank. No one should seek, seek his, his own, meaning uh, I, I'm just gonna hoard up and I'm right here and I'm gonna make sure and pull everyone else into my rightness. But it's her fault. It's his fault. Well, who's gonna be the greater one? It's going, to, it's going to be the one who doesn't seek their own, but seeks the others. You fill in the blank. Notice that it says, can we have that verse again? Notice it says here in verse 2, I implore Judea and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now that's the critical piece. No, be the same mind in the Lord. Not agreeing on every detail. There is no one who is going to agree on every detail. There are not two people in this room who will agree on every detail. It ain't going to happen. But it's be of the same mind in the Lord. In the Lord. You are agreeing. When you, what this is saying is you're agreeing who God is. In the Lord, there's unity. In the Bible, we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in perfect unity. You're agreeing who God is in the Lord, and he obviously wants something better from me than bickering about like a little kid with this man, with this woman. You want to know what God looks like? Be of the same mind in the Lord? It's this verse, Ephesians 5.21 you submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. And you say, what on earth? How, how can you two people submit to one another? Well, it's, it's a miracle, and it does happen in the body of Christ. It sort of means defer. So if you're not of the same mind, just defer to your brother or sister. Eat your pride. Stomp on your pride. You got pride. You got a pride issue. I got a pride issue. I got to stomp on it. And just defer, submit. Submit to one another in the fear of the Lord, it says. And then it says in verse 3, it says, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women. Now, who is this true companion? You following me? 
We try to slow things down, especially on Sunday morning. I urge you also, true companion, help these women. Who is that? Well, we don't know. It's the same word, by the way, used for spouse. So some people look at it, and it's, and it's like Paul talking to his wife. Uh, but we know from another book in the, in the New Testament, he's not currently married. He may have been married at one point, but in 1 Corinthians 7, he's clearly not married. I don't, we don't know who it is, but there's someone there. Maybe it's Timothy, maybe it's Barnabas. And he's saying, I urge you also, true companion, help these women. Help them. They are bickering. Uh, he, says, he says, they've labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Uh, and so at our church, when there are two people on the ministry team, and there's probably about 70 people on the ministry team at Calvary Chapel, From time to time, someone says, well, this just happens, doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. You know, I, I, I will be in this ministry. I, I'll be in the nursery, but don't put me with that woman, please. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not working with that woman. Sorry. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. We're not going to do that. It, in the world, people scatter. They make those kind of choices. In the Bible, if you are in the Lord, you don't have, an, you don't have a choice. You have to figure out a way to stomp on your pride and get along. And it says, again, it says true companion, meaning some, sometimes we need help. Sometimes the conflict gets so intense, we just got to humble ourselves. I can't do this. I need someone. And then it says there, it, it, it says there, whose names, he goes, are in the book of life, whose names are in the book of life. The Bible says that, we heard it this morning actually, someone on the worship team, was it Manuel? I don't remember, was talking about being transferred from the kingdom of darkness to transferred to the kingdom of the son of his love. And when that happens, your name is put in the, in the, in the book of life. Actually, the book was all written before the foundations of the, uh, of the world. That's another sermon for uh, uh, another day. But it, it connects back to verse 20 of chapter 3, which says our citizenship is in heaven. Meaning it's written. Like every one of you who's a citizen of the United States, your name is written somewhere in a roll somewhere that you're a citizen of the United States or whatever country you're in, yet your name's written somewhere. Same thing the Bible calls, it's in the book of life. And then in verse four we see, oh, just before we, before, we, um, before we move on, I just wanna put on John 13, 35. It, 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 this is just so crucial, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, but by this you, uh, by this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So who, who so if you get, you get conflict, but, but it's her fault. It's his fault. Yeah, okay. Well, who's going to be the bigger one? The bigger one of you is going to be the one who obeys this verse, who says, I just got to suck up my pride. I got to stomp on it. Paul says, in 2 Corinthians chapter four, we who are alive are always being put to death for Jesus' sake so that his life will be revealed in our mortal body. And so uh, th this is it. And so the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So let's move on. So verse four says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We spent all last week on that verse. So we will now move on. Verse five says, says let your gentleness be known to all men. Now guys, that's not, some of you read it, oh yeah, that's written, that's written to women. 
That's for women. Women are the gentle ones. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, uh, women, let your gentleness be known to all men. And guys have a problem with this. Real men are gentle. Say what, Christian? Really? I hear this kind of thing. Real men aren't gentle. Well, that's your carnal, foolish self saying that. You're thinking like the world thinks. Listen, you've left the WWF and you are with Jesus now. And this is who Jesus is. He says, he, Jesus only ascribes two adjectives to himself in the New Testament. And one is gentle and one is lowly. This is Jesus speaking. I am gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus is in you, brother. Jesus is in your sister. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? Let your gentleness be known to all men. Earlier in Philippians, there was another verse we were in for an entire Sunday morning message. Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What did we say about that verse? Uh, we said this, that if you've opened up your heart to Jesus Christ, recognizing that he lived for you to credit his perfect life to your account, heaven requiring, God requiring perfection. If he died for you, you deserve death and hell. He, he, he suffered death and hell on the cross for you and then he rose again from the dead. And you open up your heart to him and you say, come in, come in Jesus, be my king, my savior. The Bible says you're saved from the judgment of God and Jesus says, once you're saved, you become the light of the world. You are the light of the world, Jesus says. But the problem is we have so much baggage covering the light, the world can't see the light. Hence, we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, meaning really seriously. And one area of baggage that you and I have to work out is the baggage of anger the baggage of impatience, the baggage of frustration, aggravation. How do we work it out? By getting on our knees before the Lord and, and, and crying out, Lord, you, you see this anger? You see this impatience? You see this frustration? It's covering up my light. Help me, Lord. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Before we move on, I want to quote this verse. Proverbs 16, 2, the patient or the gentle are better than warriors and those who rule their temper better than the conqueror of a city. And so who wants the WWF when you can be joined to Jesus and be like that, better than the conqueror of a city? Let's move on. Verse uh, end of verse five says this. It says, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Really familiar verse. Again, end of verse five says, the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, this is a great verse to break down, verse six. Let's break it down in five, in five phrases. Can we have that, Wenley? Here it is. Number one, it says, be anxious for nothing. 
Number two, it says, but in everything. It doesn't say some things. It says everything. Number three, by prayer and supplication. Number four, with thanksgiving. Number five, let your request be made known to God. So let's take these one by one. Uh, Wendley, can we have number one? Just number one there. There it is. Be anxious for nothing. Por nada estén afanosos. Be anxious for nothing. Now, why is it? Why are you being told that? Why are you being told be anxious for nothing? Well, we spent a whole Sunday, last Sunday, in verse 4. It's really because of verse 4. Let's go back to verse 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. That's a command. That's command language. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Why be anxious for nothing? Because you were commanded to rejoice and anxiety kills your joy. Fear and anxiety, they're both wrapped up in one another. They kill your joy. 1 John 4.18 says this, fear, anxiety involves torment. Can anyone agree with me that that is true? Oh man, fear and anxiety involves torment. I love this, I'm with, with each, um, with each book I teach through, I try to find a commentary who's just, who's just has a heart for God. And I found this guy, obscure guy. His name is Robert Johnstone. This is what he says. Can I have the next quote, Wenley? He says, within our hearts by nature, my brethren, there is rioting and turbulence. <laughs> Can anyone agree with me on that? Within our hearts, by nature, my brethren, there is rioting and turbulence. So again, be anxious for nothing. Why be anxious for nothing? Because it robs us of our joy. There's another reason to be anxious for nothing. And get ready for this. Buckle up your seatbelts. Anxiety is sin. Now, I remember being in a Bible years ago, not as long as I've known Bob, but it was 35 years ago. I was in a Bible study, a home fellowship, and there's a bunch of people there, and they started talking about anxiety, and there was the suggestion that it was sin, and a doctor, a medical doctor, and I know, there's medical doctors in this room. They may start throwing spears at me when I, when I say this. But a medical doctor broke in and goes, let's get one thing clear. Anxiety is not sin. It's a natural response. It, 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 there's nothing sinful about it. And then an elder in the church breaks in and goes, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Anxiety is sin. I mean, this was like, a, whoa, what's going to happen here? The Bible teaches that it is sin. Now, in fairness to my doctor friend, because I, I don't want someone, one of you guys to throw a spear, or one of you women to throw a spear at me. It is true that an initial response of anxiety is sometimes a God-given natural response to warn us about something that we should be warned about. The problem is that sin has just twisted it, aggravated it, exaggerated it, um, and, and, and made it irrational. Oh man, that guy that just walked by me, he looked at me he's weird. I, he's, I'm sure he's going to follow me and kill me. Ah! That, that's, what, that, that's what it's done. Sin has just twisted that God-given natural response that at one time, long, 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 long time ago, Genesis chapter 2, was a pure response 
and made it into something that it's never been made and, and has multiplied it by about 10,000 uh, 10, times. Uh, again, our hearts are nothing but turbulent about rioting. And what was the other word he used? Uh, turbulence. And, and, and it's become that for the most part, except initially and only rarely is it, is it a natural response that's a good, pure one to warn us about something because most of the time it's irrational and crazy. Anxiety is sin. Now, why is that? Because it involves unbelief. And the Bible could not be clear that unbelief is sin. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 says this, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Unbelief is, is a choice to reject the obvious. The world all around us, Romans 1 says, uh, it's obvious that, Romans 1 says, it's obvious there's a God. But it says in Romans 1, though, though they knew God and they knew even his glory, they rejected them and became fools in unbelief. Unbelief, unbelief in what? That God is, but also Christian. Unbelief that God is with you and he's gonna care for you. That's why anxiety is sin. It's, it's an insult to God. And believe me, I was anxious this morning. I pr never, never open up text prior to, prior to the service because I, I don't want some text to distract me. But sure enough, I did. Boing, and it, you know, whoa, you know, and, 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 and I got to practice this sermon and present my anxiety to God. But, but, but it, 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 it's unbelief um, because... You have so many promises, Christian, that God is with you. Hebrews 13, five, very basic, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Next verse, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he's annoyed at you. No, he cares for you. Next verse. Now, this is an interesting one. We just read it, except we read a different translation. The translation of the New King Jam translation says the Lord is at hand, but the NIV, those of you who are reading the NIV and your Spanish translations, don't say the Lord is at hand. Say the Lord is near. And there's a debate among Bible commentators. Does this mean... Does that verse mean the Lord is near or the Lord is at hand? Uh, if it says the Lord's at hand, that pretty much means your Bible translator means it's talking about Jesus' second coming. If, if your Bible tra translation says the Lord is near, it means the translator may, may believe what I think is the right one, and this is not something we get into a fight about, but it means that the Lord is near. The Bible says that the Lord is near you. He's with you. And to me, that makes more sense because what does the next verse say? Don't be anxious about anything. Is everyone following me? Yes. And, and if it's the Lord coming a second time, it, it seems out of context. But you may be right. Now, there's some of you who are just grumbling. I can't believe Pastor Steve just said that. Well, you know, love me, love me, grace me, grace me. The Lord is near is what I think it is. And, and, and can we have that again, Wendley? The Lord is near, and that's the reason that we, can, we don't have to be anxious. Do not be anxious about anything, it says. Be anxious for nothing. Nothing means nothing. And I can't go on to the next part of the verse without quoting Psalm 37. Do not fret. It only causes harm. <laughs> Don't you love that? Don't you love the clarity? But let's move on. So the first part of the verse says, be anxious for nothing. The second part says, 
but in everything. Can we have that, Wenley? But in everything. Very simple. We're going to break this down. Everything means everything. In everything, you are worried about whether your manicure color looks goofy. I can't ask God about that. Yes, you can. God, would you put to my mind to rest over this ridiculous looking manicure that I came to church with? Perfectly fine. I don't know about getting that excited, but you know. It says in everything. A son or daughter who has rejected God and if they died Today, at this moment, they would step into eternity without God forever. Please, Lord, save him. Please, Lord, save her. Save her, Lord. In everything. It speaks to the relationship that the Lord wants with you to bring him everything, to not be left out. You are his, he is yours, the Bible says, And in everything, he wants you coming to him. Number three, can we have that, Wenley? By prayer and supplication. By prayer and supplication. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. Now, when you see those words together, think of prayer, uh, think of sort of a heart of devotion towards God and the supplication as the specific thing. So prayer and supplication. You will see those two a lot in the Bible together. So prayer is, is, is sort of what goes into the prayer, the heart behind the prayer. God is El Shaddai. He's God Almighty. He's a gracious, loving, caring, gentle father. He's not the big guy upstairs. That's not who God is. He's God Almighty, a gracious, loving, caring, gentle Father. Our Father who art in heaven, that's the prayer. The supplication is, give us this day our daily bread. It's that specific part of the prayer. Next part, or no, we're still in prayer and supplication. Can we see that again? You know, I, I've spoken <clears throat> about this before by prayer and supplication But there does need to be some, that there does need to be some measure of intensity in your prayer. If you really want verse seven, and I know every single person in this room wants verse seven, the peace that passes understanding. I know every one of you wants it. The whole world's running after that. The, 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 the crack addict has that first hit with crack, and then for the rest of their addiction until it's gone, they're chasing that first high, and they never find it. A, a, a person who understands the peace that passes understanding will hit it over and over and over again. And I know you want it. But there's got to be some measure of intensity. I quoted... Oh, about six weeks ago, there's a book by Dallas Willard. It's called The Divine Conspiracy. And it talks about the lack of character in the body of Christ. The, just the integrity, the lack of it. And how to move beyond that to a place of great integrity. I'm telling you, it, it, it means taking those things in us, that lie, liar, that cheater, that stealer we are, and, and with intensity approaching the Lord. And, and Dallas Willard starts talking about um, this towards the end of the book. I've, re I've read it twice with a number of the brothers in the church. And it, just getting to, to, that, to that place of intensity, just saying, God, I hate this anger. I hate it. It's here. Some measure of intensity. And I remember when I first read that in, in, in Dallas Willard, within 24 hours, I read another book. It's called The Still Hour by Austin Phelps. It's an obscure guy. I just happened to be reading it because Spurgeon recommended it. 
And he says this on page 49 of his little book. He says, we lose many prayers because of the lack of the, the specificity of the object and the intensity of the desire. And then he goes on and, and he says this. He says, the scriptural examples of prayer, meaning the examples of prayer in the Bible, most of them have an unutterable intensity. Some of you, man, when, when you're stressed out, when you're anxious, you will go grab your friend and you will, some coworker, I am so stressed out. <laughs> have you ever done that with the Lord? Have you ever done that? If you haven't, then there's a reason that you don't experience that peace that passes understanding. You gotta do it. You gotta get on your face. I'm so stressed out, Lord! It's okay. You can do it. It's crying out, crying out, crying out. In, 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 in Spanish, clamando, clamando, clamando. Throughout the Bible, his people. By prayer and supplication. Let your anxiety, or pray that your anxiety, anxious thoughts. Remember the guy who I quoted a couple weeks ago, uh, John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. He said, there's no borders to his mind. It drives him crazy. Just the stuff goes right in. It's like, talk about an, an open border. That's an open border. but pray that it would just be a trigger of prayer. It's what I call the prayer reflex. The prayer reflex. Let me cheat a little again, just jump again to verse seven. Again, verse seven says, the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Most translations say in Christ Jesus. That reflect, that reflex, just pray that, that as soon as that thing gets into your mind, you'll just have a reflex. You know what a re, this thing, boing, you know, that, this kind of thing, uh, it, that, that you'll go right to Jesus Christ. Here's what Spurgeon says. I love Spurgeon on this. Baptize every anxiety in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And by baptize, it's like put that thing right under water, under water with the Lord. Just, just baptize it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next one, let's continue the verse. With thanksgiving. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Listen, you want a peace that passes understanding? Your anxiety has got to be presented to God, but with thanksgiving. What does that mean? It means in the process of giving your anxiety to the Lord. And I had to do this this morning because I got real stupid and I looked at my text and I shouldn't do that. But, but I, I had to do this this morning. You gotta just be thankful to the Lord. Psalm 115, great little verse here. Psalm 115, verse 12. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. So when it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, be, by prayer and request, present your, by prayer and petition, pr uh, prayer and supplication, present your request to God with thanksgiving, just tell the Lord, you know, you've been, thank you've been faithful in this kind of situation my whole life. You can leave it up there, Winley. You've been mindful of me. The Lord has been mindful of us my whole life. <laughs> when I find myself stressing out, just as I'm stressing out now, you've been with me. And you are going to bless me again. Let's move on with thanksgiving. It says, let your requests 
be made known to God. Can we have that, Wenley? Let your requests be made known to God. So again, the verse, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now some of you, you've been sharing that anxious thing, stressing you out, with everyone but God. Your friend Sue, your friend Betty, your friend Penny, your friend Samantha, your friend Frida, your mother-in-law Francine, your co-worker Martha, your 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 neighbor Mary, but 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 with your God, no. (laughs) Your friend Tom, your friend Steve, your friend Scott, your 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 co-worker Frank. But with God, no. It says, present, can we have it again, Wendley? Present your request. This is should be the obvious, but we need to be told the obvious, to God. So oftentimes when people come up to me and they say they're pouring out a problem, I I say, have you told God about this? Well, no. Present it to God. You're presenting it to me. I have this this rule now. (laughs) Well, let me just say this. Husbands, your wife is not God. She really isn't. I mean, you may think she is, but, but uh, I hope not. But, but she's not. Uh, uh, husbands, your wife is not God. I, I have this rule in our house, and you can ask Stephanie about it. She's very, very um, familiar with it. It's, it's, she's, uh, is there something wrong with you? Yes, but I need to go to the Lord with it. I don't want to poison her with my stress. Present your request to God. Your request to God. How about posture? There's not a rule on posture on how you pray. You you can be lying in bed at night. you You can be sitting. You can be walking. When you're presenting your anxious request to the Lord, but I will say this, that in a good part of the American church, there's shame in kneeling. There's just a shame, and people aren't doing it anymore. And I shared with you already that um, my scripture memory was in Mark 1, verses 1 through, well, I won't say, okay, I, I, I did a lot of verses. I have a lot of time. <laughs> That's right. But, 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 but I got to, uh, but, but the next day, but the next day, I started my, the next verses for the next scripture memory, and, and it was in verse 40, and I was just so touched by this. It says, it says, a leper came to Jesus imploring him, Kneeling down to him. Kneeling down to him and saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus said, it says Jesus had compassion on him and said, I'm willing, be cleansed. But, but the point is, we got spiritual leprosy in our hearts. In the Bible, this is another sermon for another day, but leprosy is a type of sin. And when you get a leprosy, an anxiety in you that's, that's deadening you, deadening you, that's what leprosy does, it deadens your nerves, can't, you, you, you become numb. When leprosy starts doing that to you, rather when anxiety starts doing that to you, sometimes, I would say most of the time, you gotta get on your knees and lay it out to the Lord. Let's go to the next verse. Again, it says, present your anxieties to God, verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, meaning people will see your peace and they won't understand it, and you won't understand your peace. You won't understand it. Why do I have peace now? 
my whole life in this situation. I've been freaking out. Why am I peaceful now? It says, it, it says that in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here's a Bible trivia question for you. The very last teaching that Jesus ever gave to his disciples. And the answer is John 16, 33, which says this, these things I have spoken to you. He's been speaking to them for three years. He said a lot of things. Why did he say them? He says right here, that in me you may have peace. Now that's a wowza. It's his last teaching. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. A peace that passes all understanding. Now I remember uh, 9-11. You know, we have such short memories. Let me tell you, I been using the word freak out a lot this morning, but we are talking about anxiety. After 9-11, everyone was freaking out. And don't, don't forget, well, some of you may not have been born, but, but, but at that time, it wasn't only that the two towers had gone down. Like crazy things were happening. Like people were, people were, were getting envelopes in the mail, like at the Pentagon stuff, and it had anthrax in them. And if you open them up, they, like everyone around you, th these kind of things were happening. I remember at 4 a.m., someone who was in the Bible study before the church began called me and they say, I know I have been exposed to anthrax. And let me tell you, it wasn't just him. This type of stuff was happening all around the country. And I tried to work him through that and, and, and pray and stuff like this. But I do remember um, a few weeks after our whole family went to, uh, used to go to the same person to, to cut our hair. Um, and and she, she told me, can you please tell me why you and Stephanie have peace? Because you're the only pe pers pe person that comes in here that has peace. And I was able to share with her about Jesus Christ. Mark chapter four, verse 37 says this. The disciples are in a boat, a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? N Notice how they're saying it. It's like they're desperate. It's like, uh, don't you care that we're perishing? No, that's not how. Is it, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And it says they were astonished and said, even the winds and waves obey this guy. Isaiah 26.3 says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Notice how it says, and the peace of God will guard your heart. Let me conclude with this. It says, the peace of God that surpasses under understanding will guard your heart. Will guard your heart. Why does it say that? Why does God want to guard my heart with peace? Now, we quoted these verses a lot. And I hope they really get branded on your mind. But they're, they're, God has a reason. Well, number one is he cares for you. But there's another one reason. It's Isaiah 43, verse 7. It says this, everyone who is called by my name, I have created for my glory. Can we have that, Wenley? Everyone who is created by my name, I've created from, for my glory. And then it says in uh, 1 Peter 1.8, it says this. In 1 Peter 1.8, it says... 
Do we have that? Nope, not that one. In 1 Peter 1.8, it says, you greatly rejoice, though now you are grieved by various trials, but believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So listen, what ha- look at what happens when, you, this is why God guards your peace, because when he guards your peace in the midst of various trials, you rejoice with a joy inexpressible or that can't be understood by anyone, and what happens? There's a glory that goes on you. You're fulfilling God's purpose for your life. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up at this time. If you can come up, if you're on the worship team or if you've been asked to pray, if you can keep, uh, come on up. It says, the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Bible says, Philipp, um, Wenley, can we have this? In Philippians 4, 7, it says, Jesus Christ is your peace. He himself is our peace. And it says this also in the, in, the, in the Bible. It says, in the multitude of my anxieties, he restores our soul. Can we have that one, Wenley? In the multitude of my anxieties within me, rioting with turbulence, your comforts delight my soul. Who is our comfort? It's Jesus Christ. It says he will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Can you rise now? We're just going to close with a worship song. If anything I've been talking about has stirred your heart, you'd like someone to pray for you, this is your heart. What did Robert Johnson say? It's just uh, it's filled with rioting and turbulence. You need someone to pray for you. you come up at this time. The Lord wants to put his glory right on you. That's why he says he guards you with peace. That sounds foreign to you. Come up, let's pray. And pray that peace to come upon you. If you don't know Jesus, it says Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 says Jesus Christ is our peace. If you've never opened up your heart to Jesus and says, yes, Jesus, I want you now. I'm tired of neglecting you. I'm tired of being my own Jesus. You be my Jesus. Come on up. We'll pray. The Bible says that we're saved from the judgment of God. Through grace, by faith, and that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. You can't earn a way into a relationship with God by trying to be good enough. The Bible says no one's good, not even one. But we can open up our hearts in faith to Him. The Bible says the moment we do that, Spirit of God comes in. The Christ lives within you. I want prayer to ask Jesus Christ into your life and come up as well. Father, I pray that you continue the business that you started, Lord, the opening prayer at the service today. You should finish what you want to do in our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name.